People say you should never start out any enterprise with an apology or a disclaimer, but we're going to go opposite of that tonight. Um, there's a beautiful song that Nat King Cole made famous called What Can I Say After I Say That I'm Sorry? And I wrote a prose piece simply called Sorry, and it includes so many facets of love that we're going to start off with that. has written about a client of his, an Irish woman, afflicted with a neurological disorder he called incontinent nostalgia. The same songs and songs she did not even like, songs she did not care for at all, repeating themselves in her head against her will, as if some crazy neighbor, as she described it, was subjecting her to torture by playing the same tune over and over and over again. Yet I chose this song I love it, or I did. I just feel there should be space in my brain now for more men. What can I say, dear, after I say I'm sorry? must be psychological then. I must want badly to say that I'm sorry. But for what? Because I love hearing this damn song, sorry, so much, I automatically start thinking about all the stuff I must feel sorry about. And of course, once you stick a quarter in the ancient jukebox of that Pandora's box, the list of regrets is endless. Sorry for what one didn't say that day, and then again, Sorry for what one did. Sorry for what one didn't do that day. But then again, sorry for what one irretrievably did. Sorry for the time, as he just reminded me, I made my 55-year-old son, then seven or eight, go to his room and cry for two hours because I laughed when the Green Bay Packers lost to the Colts in the very last minute of play. song, Beyond the Legions of Fathers and Sons, or the Green Bay Packers. This is intimate stuff. You start with the words, dear, and if I didn't care, and you realize that just within that single sphere of activity, love, there is, if you let yourself go and think about it, plenty to feel sorry about. 
The time I didn't approach you in time, or the time I did. The time I couldn't say no to my ardor, or the time I did. The time I watched you walk up into the night alone, or the time I did. God, it's like going to confession in the end and being asked to list all of your lifelong love errors, mistakes, oversights, inconstancies, indulgences, and discovering that when you were in love, that's just about all you ever were or did. It's endless. I'm Catholic, of course, as you may have guessed, or sorry, I once was. I suspect that whatever your denomination or lack of one, that fine art of confession, whatever form it may take, even silence is not wholly unfamiliar. We've all been in love at one time or another, and while we may be thankful on occasion, we also have much that makes us sorry. All those things I never told her, and all the stuff I shouldn't have, but did. Failing to understand at just that right moment, or the resentment I caused, because I thought I did. Falling in love with so many others, when I only should have cherished you or feeling sorry for myself because looking back now, those others were so few. God, I'm afraid we've got more on our hands here than just relationships or the Green Bay Packers. What is it then? Spiritual cleansing, absolute absolution, attaining amazing grace by purging the soul through song, coming face to face with our own fallibility, original and not so original sin, I apologize for the cliches. I am genuinely sorry. Perhaps I'm attempting to make the issue larger than it really is. Yet I have so little that's specific, so little that's not just generic to go on. I lack this specific year of sin or that specific fall from grace. Love, love, love. The more we fall into it, the more we have to give and forgive. Each of us falling asleep at night, lying beside a mate, yet dreaming of the Green Bay Packers. Falling asleep with a universal cry of contrition on our lips, surveying the entire human condition from afar with infinite compassion, and having seen and heard and felt it all, can only say, even from the depths of gratitude, for being alive. So wrong. pieces. I was breech born, truly. That's how I got my start, ass backwards. <laughs> and I was from day one allergic to my mother's milk. To compensate for the loss, medical authorities had my tiny body pumped full of orange sugar ice cream, banana pudding, and calcium pills. And all that was bad enough, but I must confess that I was born and raised, as they say, in Detroit. The city which blessed soul also conceived the automobile. The backing in this is going to be a very pretty song that Thad Jones wrote called A Child Is Born. It 
was a shock. And a source of some amusement when I got used to the shock to discover when I was in my late 60s and first read a diary that my father kept from 1934 to 1938 that I had been sick or ill throughout much of my early life. My father's firstborn son, my brother Lance, is depicted as a healthy child whom he enjoyed taking to baseball games, haircuts, and circuses. A child so highly prized that he earned the epithet Precious Lanny. If you set Precious Lanny alongside just plain Billy, as I was called, as found in my dad's diaries, the effect becomes ludicrous, absurd. I'll start with my brother. March 8th, 1933. The birth of Precious Lanny, who had his first haircut at six months and was taken to a circus as a reward for good behavior. January 14th, 1934, Lanny joins us in bed in the morning. Each day he grows cuter, and my love for him and thanks to Dorothy, my mother, grow deeper and more real. January 21st, 1934, at work all day, with the exception of walk with Dor and Lanny, who are too precious for words. February 22nd, 1934, Lanny has been walking since 11 months of age. March 8th, 1934, Precious Lanny is one year old. I pray that God may spare us to see him a good and useful man. March 18th, 1934, early church with door and reminder, remainder of morning taken up with Precious Lanny. May 5th, 1934, home in the afternoon with Lanny who is fast becoming a larger boy, physically and mentally. August 6th, 1934, Precious Lanny has his first haircut in a barber shop. Not a sound. And now we turn to Billy. Me. The, the diary does not even record my birth, January 13th, 1936, but is taken up again on January 3rd, 1937. Billy greatly troubled with four motors coming through. January 13th, 1937, Billy Miner's birthday, one year old, sore throat and head cold. Was that me or my father? I assume it's him, but based on what follows, I'm not so sure. January 17th, 1937. Lanny very much elated over his new mattress, but there was no mention of Billy whatsoever. Then Dorothy and Lanny go on a sleigh ride. February 17th, 1937. My mother's mother, Mrs. Gale, visiting Minneapolis, where we then lived. Billy doing a large dose of crying. February 26, 37, Billy sick, fever, stomach disorder, doctor in the seat, Billy. February 28, 1937, Billy much better, almost himself again. March 13, 1937, Billy stands alone, unassisted the day, but doesn't walk. 14 months. My wife informs me that most kids are up and walking at 12. March 19, 1937, Billy has a bad cold and fever. Dora and I go to a picture show to see After the Thin Man, up with Billy all night long. March 20th, 1937, Dr. Rob buys to see Billy. March 23rd, 1937, Billy still ill and inactive with cold, snowstorm. April 1st, 1937, Billy troubled with his stomach. April 24th, 1937, Billy's itch, not so important. May 22nd, 1937, Took down remainder of storm windows, washed windows, put up screens, cleaned the garage. Lanny helped considerably. Billy not feeling well. And so it goes. Not that I ever wanted to be precious Billy. Far from that yet. Um, my sister and brother and I collected what we called Dorothyisms. Uh, my mom will live to be nearly 102 years old. And I'm going to do a little bit of this now. Throughout our adult lives, my brother and sister and I have collected Dorothyisms. Our mother's name is Dorothy. Dorothy Trowbridge Gale Minor. Non sequiturs or casual or innocent insights that suggest disinterest are more likely a capacity to distance herself from reality and remain slightly off key or out of it in her own gentle way. I won't say inattentive, but some of that may get involved in the mix. As well. When she was 20, my mother worked for the Detroit Edison Company in Birmingham, Michigan, where she spent her teens after having been born and raised in Detroit. And she mentioned going out with one of the linemen. They were rugged, outdoor types, she said, but very polite. 
and very nice to her. What she remembered most about her date with his tool belt, an image my sister and I had a great deal of fun with, elaborating on its metaphorical implications. When not so long ago a, first, a cousin first had a baby and then got married several months later, my mom asked, was there a time when it was the other way around? And when a music producer friend of mine met mom, who was then still in her 80s, an attractive woman, she was devastatingly pretty as a teenage girl, and jokingly said they should get married. He was about a third her age. My mother glanced off in the distance, then smiled and said, of course, we couldn't have any children. <laughs> Our favorite Dorothyism, however, is her response to a visitor who, when my father was quite advanced in years, praised him for not looking his age, saying that my father had very few wrinkles on his face. My mother thought about this for a while and then said, that's because he never uses his face. <laughs> Tacky's gonna do the nearness of you. And we're gonna jump to adolescence. Pants pegged to perfection, point of suffocation. 
Eisenhower style with Levi jackets, flat top pass of the duck haircuts. We acquired religious leader every six weeks on a field trip to Hamtramck. And the fact that at least one of us, me, had once read a book. Mez and Mez Rose, Radio Blues. Jeff and her brother lent us a touch of class. A wealthy family, the Borgettes lived 15 miles north of Detroit in Bloomfield Hills. And beneficent as Kennedy's, they had granted us two privileges. Their massive front lawn, and on evenings which became as special to me as holidays, the right to pitch our sleeping bags on Persian carpets covering the hardwood floors of their banquet-sized living room. There, on the occasion of slumber parties before falling asleep at dawn, I would attempt to assess the distance which separated myself and the Bourgettes. At the time, it seemed incalculable. It still does. Yet I alone spent each of those evenings with Jeff. She was a fair pianist. I was on my way to being a pro. And while my companions pursued the symposium elsewhere, Jeff's brother showing off a zoot suit with shoulders so outrageously large, he'd had to solder together a special coat hanger, but one so wide the suit would no longer fit in the closet. She and I stole off to the family room. It was the only room in that giant house where we were not likely to run into any other members of the family. And there, on a grand piano, whose magnificence and fine touch also seemed incalculable, Jeff and I played Boogie Boogie Duets. describe Jeff, but I can't. She had then and she has now no particulars. None. No such properties as a pert nose, good humor, smooth vanilla enamel skin, round and white as the softball shoulders or endless neck. Jeff made of my knowledge even of lack teeth, but I doubt it. Deficits were the last thing in the world I was attuned to then, but I probably would have noticed. Jeff cannot be described. She, like the living room, her brother Zutsu, the lawn, the grand piano, possessed magnificence, but nothing memorable, nothing photographic. Not long after that evening at the keeper, I actually danced with her. I held Jeff in my arms, or more likely, she held me. She knew how to dance, I didn't. Unlike my brother, who cheated and taken lessons at Arthur Murray's, I danced by ear which meant I spent an inordinate amount of time looking at my shoes. The Borgettes, philanthropic as they were, had placed my name and the names of my friends, the gang, on the list for late spring debutante parties. So on a mild night in May, in some enormous ballroom in Detroit, I, wearing a rigid urine yellow tuxedo, hair shaped to the semblance of whatever constituted teenage decorum at the time, actually danced with Jeff Borgett, or more likely, against the fine, lovely tide of her. Wait for me, please, I whispered, my nose stationed between the sternal clidomastoid muscles of her neck, and I'll have to confess I just had my first drink, less than a quarter teaspoon of scotch, but separated from Jeff, I knew I'd be reading. Are you all right, she asked. Natch, I said, lying. My feet, having expended so much effort avoiding hers, had just struck up an unfortunate acquaintance with one another. I'm getting married next month, she said. Natch, I said. Left shoe coating the top of the right with dance weights. Huh? I'm getting married. I'm getting sick, I said. And I led toward the sideline, Jeff following. But you said you were all right. I walked out under the terrace where adventurous spring insects were being electrocuted in a device which resembled a birdcage. 
You don't have to throw up. She asked. Actually, that had been the farthest thing from my mind, but Jeff has always had a stunning influence on me, and so I threw up. Right there into a big green awning which read the Detroit Athletic Club. She, for a moment, turned away. She then turned away for the rest of the evening and the rest of my life. I was left staring, even though I was no longer dancing, at my shoes. Here's another piece about adolescence. cynical delight after a night of watching the square couples shuffle back and forth over dance floors. The floor splayed with soft colored light, soppy signs glowing in the dark along the walls. Jim and Janet, Ted and Jane, Bev and Doug. The couples molesting and mugging each other in time to my music. That's what hurt the most. I took cynical light in packing up after each of these dates, watching the last crinoline satin chief young lady, a wilted gardenia clutching her left breast, depart beside some smirking stud, nothing but basketball markings and busted crepe and the smeared winter tracks of dance wax left behind. While I unscrewed the bolt on my ride symbol and packed my drums, item by item, away in their cozy canvas covers. 
I shared the male vocalist. We were trying out that he was a more than adequate replacement for Sheridan. Guarding the drums, piece by piece, out to the car, watching the red summer exhaust of the lovers depart. Knowing they all grown horny in their ice bird hearts to my music. <laughs> We're gonna jump to something new. Um, I've been having this wonderful experience where I'll wake up in the morning and all of a sudden there'll be a tune. And I'll be walking and there it is. Uh, this started out as a poem. It's called My Fingers Refuse to Sleep. And um, I woke up in the morning and the music was there for it also. And I think now it belongs to Jackie. She does a beautiful job with this. It's called My Fingers Refuse to Sleep.
the CVS pharmacy to re-up on what I call geriatric maintenance supplies. <laughs> Metamucil for my intestines, Sudafed for my nose, Prevacid for the esophagus, Neclizin for the inner ear, Centrin Silver for men for my bones, etc. And on the walk home, I stopped in one of my favorite spots just before Lover's Point, a beach area in the town of Pacific Cove. I sat on my favorite bench there because it affords on bright, pleasant days such as this, a splendid view of Monterey Bay. like a walking path that leads from Lover's Point to where, toward where I sit, and I watch the group of people in different colored robes, orange, brown, white, approach, thinking they would pass behind me as I faced the bay. They were wearing large Asian cone-shaped hats to cover their faces. At first I thought it might be a promo walk for the Feast of Lanterns, a fun but mostly bogus Chinese festival held this time of year, one that features teenage queens. But these people were walking slowly, way too slowly for that. I'm not sure why, but they decided to veer off the main route and took a narrow, very twisty path that would pass right by the spot on which I sat on my bench, much out of their way. As they approached, I realized they were very monastic looking. They were Buddhist monks. The leader, a Dalai Lama lookalike, was dressed in an orange robe. The rest, seven or eight of them, in brown or white. One was a woman, hatless, with a shaved head. She was very pretty. Mm -hmm. When the leader passed by me, he said, you are sitting alone, all by yourself. Without thinking at all, I lifted my hands and arms outward toward everything beyond my solitary spot on the bench, and I said, yes, me and all this. He didn't slacken his slow, quiet pace, but he seemed pleased by the response, as if I were on a Zen retreat a session and had been called in for a San Zen session, face-to-face -face meeting with a master, and had managed to come up with a more than an adequate response to some Zen calling, something worthy of the Momonko. He smiled benignly and passed on such a bizarre, wondrous moment. Why had they chosen or been destined to come up that path? I sat a bit longer and started back up the hill to the town area of Pacific Grove. groups of people walking, talking together, families perhaps, or just friends, two men jogging, chatting away, two mothers with strollers and children jabbering a mile a minute. The only solitary figure I found amidst this communal hubbub was some guy talking or nearly screaming on a cell phone. Locked in one of those cul-de-sac conversations we are now forced to overhear on a daily basis. I glanced down at my bag of geriatric maintenance goods my support group, my very own monastic entourage. And I thought, even though I was walking, it is so fine to just sit here alone. <laughs> This is a new poem, and it's about Greece. Uh, Betty and I lived in Greece for nearly a year, 
few months, and, um, almost as glorious as this setting behind us. Um, and I thought I would put it together with a Greek song I love by uh, Miki Satidarakis, the great composer. And the lyrics are by Yorgos Seferis. And when we were there, we discovered this amazing thing is that you would hear pop songs, and the lyrics would be by Nobel Prize laureates like Seferis or Otis Sefanitis or Yanis Loritsos. I couldn't believe it. You hear these kids coming out from the disco and singing, He's a god, he's a god. I said, My god, those are lyrics by a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Lord, um, I'm going to read the translation of this, and then we'll do it in Greek, and then I'll read the poem that I wrote, and uh, come back to the Greek maybe. Sleep bereft you in green leaves like a tree. You breathe like a tree in the quiet light. In the limpid spring, I watched your face, eyelids closed, eyelashes bruising the water. In the soft grass, my fingers found your fingers. I held your pulse a moment, and I felt your heart's pain in another place. Thank you. 
to the Civil War. Um, let's see, it's my, that's why I'll do this as short as I can. It was my great grandfather's first cousin's son, Charles Minor Blackford. And the entire family had strong union sympathies. But um, the Civil War started, he'd been a lawyer for five years, rather successful. He was 27 years of age in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. And the war started, and Lincoln said, We're coming through, and we need troops. And three of his brothers, the whole family uh, eventually, had already enlisted in the Confederate Army. So the next thing that Charles um, he found himself in the Second Virginia Cavalry, and he was at every battle from Manassas first all the way down to the fall of Richmond. And he, Susan stayed in Lynchburg and had extraordinary experiences of her own. And the letters that they exchanged throughout the war are some of the most beautiful love letters I've ever read in my life. So I was very fortunate. I, there's a two volume edition, and I condensed them to an 11 page script. And uh, we did the CD, and I wrote a score of music for it. Um, and it's called Love Letters of Lynchburg. And this is. Jackie will be Susan, and I'll be Charles. And this is a scene where she goes down to his law office, and everything's just as he left it. He's been away in the army for about three years, and it's been probably two years since they've seen each other. I would have enjoyed being with you at Honeywood. I 
she's so like to walk with you through my favorite haunts and told you the traditions of each. The large oak tree at the foot of the lawn where the cider press once sat was our playhouse in common with the summer house. I should like, too, to have taken you to the bank of violets at the end of the lilac walk where, when alone, I used to sit and read novels and poetry and dream and speculate as to my own future. But no picture of anticipated happiness arose to what the reality was until this cruel war beclouded our lives. They were together the fall of Richmond, and um, he sends her to Charlottesville for safekeeping. Uh, actually, another relative. John E. Minor, and, and she doesn't quite get what she expected when she's there. You stole this from Hector Berlioz, I love it so much. It's from Romeo and Juliet, but the rest is mine. events which passed during the terrible and feverish months we spent together in Richmond, that beleaguered and starving city. We were very much troubled to secure the necessities of life. Our personal fate and future was so beclouded that nothing but a long training and a life of uncertainty and danger enabled us to keep up. But keep up we did. And of course, my dearest and just what I told you when you insisted upon my leaving Richmond to come to safety here in Charlottesville would happen, has happened. And what I ran away from, I ran into. When the rumor reached us that the Union soldiers were coming down from Waynesboro, everybody set work to prepare for the Raiders by hiding everything of value. I first stored away the hams I brought away from Richmond in a safe place in the cuddy of Mr. Miner's house. We waited for the Yankees all day, most anxiously, indeed in a state of wild excitement. I took our silver sugar dish, cream pot, bowl, forks and spoons and put them in the legs of a pair of your own drawers from a trunk, tying up each leg at the ankle and buckling the band about my waist. They hung under and were concealed by my hoops. It did well while I sat still, but as I walked and when I sat down, the planking destroyed all hope of concealment. <laughs> of course, the ridiculous side of the situation struck me and I could not restrain my laughter, which sister said was very unseemly at such a time, but I could not help it. It was partly nervous, but there were many amusing scenes, as you can well imagine, and what is amusing will amuse me, you know, whatever the surroundings. Uh, we're going to end with a couple, couple pieces. This is a piece about my dad um, that folks seem to like. I came home once uh, when we were having their 60th wedding now. And again, this is an original piece of music. Sixtieth wedding anniversary. Because my plane was laboring, late arriving, my mother had stepped out to do some shopping, and my father answered the door. He didn't know who I was. Following an aneurysm operation, his mind was failing. 
most of his memory shot. When I told him who I was, his son, he smiled. Well, Dora will be sorry she missed you, I said. Dora is my mother, short for Dorothy. I told my father I'd hang around a little longer in the house I'd grown up in to see if Dora returned. He smiled, but no longer that famous smile that could charm the pants right off a snake. It was a genial, wistful smile now, puzzled but benign. I showed him photographs of my own children, now adults. But each time I turned a page, he forgot what or whom he just seen. I said that I'd made them just as he made me. He nodded his head slowly, appraising the situation. First, you made me dad, then I made them. When my mother returned, and once we got caught up on recent events, beyond who had manufactured whom in the past, she excused herself to prepare dinner in the kitchen. My father has always enjoyed hearing me play the piano, so I slipped over to the spinet on which I had learned, and I began to play long ago and far away. singing during those sessions in the past when we all gathered around the piano, but he did show his rich appreciation by way of tap dancing on smooth tiles in front of the fireplace, rendering his first great soft shoe. One leg drawn back, tentative, sweeping, the other teasing the carpet, then both legs sliding smooth, caressing the marble, transforming that firm grid of tile to sandpaper. My father smiling in that way that everyone agreed was infectious. Yet now as I played, a miracle took place. This man, who seemed so lost to both time and in space outside his own home, began to sing. At first I thought I was imagining things, yet I distinctly heard his voice quavering, weak but tender, vocalizing in time. Chills run up and down my spine. Aladdin's lamp is mine. And chills did run up and down my spine, and I nearly burst into tears, tears of sorrow, tears of joy for the persistence of human memory, the indestructibility of human feeling. From what depths of being had he pulled out these words? From how many nights of song? What geologic layers have been shattered like the miracle of that flower, the saxifrage, which burst through rock? I knew for whom he was singing. It was not for the son he had once made or helped make. It was for the woman in the kitchen preparing dinner with a percipient's poised prayer, compassion, and inherent dignity she extends to nearly all that she does. For my mother, my father, was singing, just one look, and then I know that all I longed for long ago was you. We <laughs> heard about um, James Moon a little bit. This is a uh, piece, and then we're going to make amends with the song. Or something. Um, at age 19, having fulfilled my role as family humorist and bearer of many legends, I set out on my own for New York City, Brooklyn, specifically where I became a student in the visual arts at Pratt Institute. I landed a job as fully undeserving house pianist at a place called the 456 Club on DeKalb Avenue. The club lacked a piano, so a man named Bruno Ferrari, I kid you not, that was his name, drove me to a warehouse in Brooklyn. We took an elevator up to a massive third floor loft filled with nothing but pianos of every shape and make. And Bruno stood off to one side wearing an honest-to-God fedora and smoking a scar as large as the bulge beneath his coat. Tapping a large ash from the cigar, he flailed the room with his free hand and he said, Pick out a piano, kid. 
And I was terrified, but I did as told, and so I started to play at the 456 Club. I am ashamed to say that I had a cabaret card required in those days when Thelonious Monk could not get one. We're going to make amends <laughs> to Thelonious Monk. Jackie's going to sing one of his <coughs> greatest tunes, Rounded Night.
Tyreen, I guess, yeah. Tyreen. What a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.